This video is brought to you by Straight Goods News, Canada's alternative online news source. Visit straightgoods.ca. Late yesterday, the Council submitted the final piece of evidence in the matter of the legal actions launched by nine electors under the Canada Elections Act to overturn results of the May 2011 federal election in the ridings of Don Valley East, Elmwood Transcona, Nipissing Timiskaming, Saskatoon Rosetown Bigger, Vancouver Island North, Winnipeg South Centre, and Yukon. Today, we are releasing the results of research undertaken by Ecos Research um, Associates. We were commissioned to look into uh, basically three questions. Uh, first of all, uh, was there evidence of, an, of misleading calls in the seven writings that we were asked to look at? Uh, was that, if that was the case, is there evidence that that was targeted to certain types of groups in a, in a, in a fashion which would be improbable otherwise? And finally, did it make any difference? Was there any, did the world look any different if this stuff happened than it wouldn't have, it would have if it hadn't? The challenge of looking at that question nearly a year later is, 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 is significant. Uh, we did a number of, um, of uh, methodological uh, innovations to try and ensure that we could come up with an accurate answer and we feel pretty comfortable that we have sound answers to the first two questions and some strongly suggestive answers to the last question. Um, we, in order, one of the problems that we have is as we move away in time, it's now nearly a year from this event, uh, Memories become a little more sketchy, and we also know that this issue has been in the public profile, so there's a chance that some of the issues could be reactive. In other words, respondents could know about the question we're looking at, and in some ways their responses could be different than they would have been if they hadn't heard about it. In order to deal with this, we decided to create a comparison group, and the comparison was group uh, created by creating a random sample of all of the writings where there had been no reported activity. Interestingly enough, it does appear that there is activity going on in most of the country. In fact, one of the features of the last election seems to be that there was a ubiquitous presence of this sorts, uh, these sorts of activities. But we did find that when we compared the comparison group with the seven <coughs> subject writings, there were some what is revealing, I think, was the improbable connection between those individuals who, during the first stage of voter identification, provided the fact that they were not voting for the uh, Conservative Party. Uh, that seems to be linked by a factor of two to one to an increase probability of receiving a second late call. Now the second late calls which were received by approximately 17 percent of the uh, of all voters at least recalled in the uh, in the subject writings which is a couple of points higher than in the other writings uh, were in fact a, a blend of both legitimate and it seems in, in according to the survey there are other kinds of calls, calls however which would not be legitimate. The individuals that are calling are required to identify themselves as representing a political party. They have to identify who they are accurately and they have to provide accurate information. It appears that there was a significant incidence of calls which according to the respondents did not fall into that category. For example, in the subject writings that we looked at, there was almost no actual movement of polling stations. In fact, only one in one writing, which is a fairly picayune fraction of the overall stations, actually was changed. Uh, somewhat surprisingly then, we find that uh, a significant number of the respondents who received late calls said they were told that their voting station was changed. Uh, so we would classify that as an illegitimate call. Similarly, although less clearly, callers that did not recall the political party identifying themselves and were told that they were being called, or at least thought they were being called by Elections <laughs> Canada, constituted another significant fraction of calls in these ridings. Uh, in this case, um, the reality is that Elections Canada called nobody, but there was a sizable number of individuals in each of these writings uh, who felt that they had been called by Elections Canada. Finally, we asked people whether or not the information they'd received in the late calling was indeed accurate or whether they had received misinformation. And there was a significant portion who said, no, actually the information that I received from that call was inaccurate. Now, What's, what's also really notable is that the pattern with which those calls were received, the misleading calls, was dramatically skewed to those people who were not 
supporters of the conservative the, government. The uh, incidents would range from, in the case of questions where you were told that your voting, your polling station had changed, to differences of three to four times the likelihood of receiving that call if you were, for example, uh, a liberal, an NDP, or a um, Green Party supporter than if you were a conservative supporter. Similarly, although less dramatically in the case of the elections, uh, the calls that were that seemed to be identified by Elections Canada, there was about a 50% greater likelihood of saying that you received that call if you were but not we a have conservative now, supporter. We uh, have served all of the evidence that we're going to adduce in support of the seven applications that have been brought before the federal court. Uh, the respondents, uh, who include uh, all of the candidates and uh, and uh, the chief electoral officer uh, have now 30 days to uh, introduce uh, their affidavit evidence that they'll that they'll be relying on in support of the, their participation in the in the proceeding. We know that only uh, the conservative candidates in the ridings will be opposing uh, our application. Um, the cases will be managed, uh, the court has advised. We will certainly be making the argument that they be dealt with as uh, quickly as possible. This is the classic case of uh, justice uh, delayed will be justice denied in light of the fact that almost a year has now passed since the election. First, we submitted an affidavit from Annette de Gagné, a re former responsive marketing group, RMG, employee in Thunder Bay, Ontario. During the election, she made calls on behalf of Conservative Party candidates in many ridings, and she identified herself as calling on behalf of the Conservative Party. Three days before the election, however, she and her colleagues were given a new script that stated calls were being made on behalf of something called the, quote, Voter Outreach Centre. And their purpose was to advise voters that Elections Canada had changed the location of their polling station. She overheard one of her colleagues adjust the script to read that he was calling on behalf of Elections Canada. She called voters in many different ridings, including specifically Nipissing to Miskaming. Elections Canada has confirmed in a letter that only one polling station in one riding of the seven involved in our cases was changed, and that was in Vancouver Island North, and the process used to notify electors did not include telephone calls. We also submitted an affidavit from Bob Penner, President and CEO of Strategic Communications Incorporated. In a 20 plus year career as a political consultant, Penner has developed and implemented sophisticated voter contact programs. Stratcom was one of the first Canadian firms to specialize in this area. Penner's expert evidence is that if a call advising electors that Elections Canada has made a last minute change to polling station locations is made to the supporter of another political party, it was for the purpose of suppressing the vote. Quote, the only plausible explanation for such calling to have occurred is for someone at the senior level in a central political campaign to have authorized the strategy and provided the data and the funds with the which to carry results it out. of the ethos research are conclusive and shocking. The fraudulent calling was widespread. Tens of thousands of deceptive calls were made. It was targeted at individuals who were not supporting the Conservative Party, and it had the desired effect. Supporters of the NDP, Liberals, and Greens who received these calls were less likely to vote. While it is very difficult to quantify the absolute effect, ECOS estimates that between 0.8 to 2.2% of the total eligible voters in the seven ridings were successfully dissuaded from voting as a direct result of these calls. Since we first launched our campaign, the Conservative Party messages have been these. The Conservative Party did not make misdirecting uh, calls misdirecting voters. There was one rogue campaigner who was responsible for such calls in the riding of Guelph, Ontario. Some calls may have been made inadvertently, and the Conservative Party wants to get to the bottom of this. The Council of Canadians is a nonpartisan organization. Our supporters include members and supporters of all of Canada's political parties. But the evidence is powerful and leading inexorably in only one direction. We know that the voter suppression campaign was extensive. It was targeted at supporters of the New Democratic Party, the Liberal Party and the Greens, and it had to have been approved by a senior campaign official with access to a central database and authority to spend money. 
The response of the Conservatives to this latest evidence is entirely predictable because anyone who dares to raise questions about their political agenda or to challenge their actions is attacked. We fully expect that they will lash out at everybody involved in this process. They will call us names and accuse us of having nefarious motives. By attacking our character, they hope to marginalize us and to diminish our evidence. But this is about the rights of individual Canadians to cast their ballots freely. It is about exposing dirty tricks perpetrated in last May's federal election. It is about defending democratic rights and principles that all Canadians believe in. We are determined and we will follow this through to the end. We believe we have built a very strong court case to overturn the election results in the seven ridings and to restore to those Canadians their most fundamental democratic right. Uh, the results are illegitimate, illegitimate, yes. We believe in all seven ridings that there is sufficient quantum of data to indicate that the elections were stolen in those uh, rights. I think that there's more that can be done and should be done, but these conclusions are pretty solid. Point then, so if you take the 1.5% and then apply the margin of error, that's where you create a band of 0.8% to 2.2% as the out absolute outside possibilities. So instead of just saying the 1.5%, because there is a margin of error attached to that, you can very you know, strongly state that between 0.8% and 2.2% would be the impact. If you do the analysis based on the 0.8 to the 2.2, and we do have a sheet that, that shows this, at the 2.2, that would be sufficient to overturn the results in all seven ridings. At 1.5, it is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 of the seven, and at zero, even at 0 0.8, which is absolutely the lowest possible uh, number, it would be one, two, three ridings. I'm sorry, so, so the range is three to seven, seven. ridings there would have been. In the seven ridings, ridings is possible there could be more. Uh, the only one by 11 seats or 12 seats or whatever, is it possible, is, is this the direction you're heading to overturn the actual election results? The direction we're heading is we still believe that there are other ridings where the deceptive calls could have affected the outcome and we would very much like to see people continue to come forward in those. Another example is Etobicoke Center, which as you know is subject to a different legal action. Um, and it was in court yesterday. And we have evidence in that riding that there were deceptive calls made and harassing phone calls made. Uh, but that's not the issue that was in front of the judge yesterday. It was merely around the questions of irregularities of voter registration and double registration and so on. But the margin of victory in that riding is so narrow that we think you could probably have a look at that riding and easily come forward with a very solid case based on the deceptive phone calls, which are fraudulent. But do you think there'll be more than seven? Yes. It's, it's a little complicated, but... I'm guessing in the subject writings, it was at least 10% of all voters in those writings received some a call which would have been defined as deceptive by them. The, the range could go up to 15%, but I would say it's in that range. Sorry, 10% to 15%? So there's 307 in the seven writings? Yeah, so there's 330,000 people, voters in those writings, so it's quite likely that somewhere between 30 and 50,000 received this sort of call. What percentage of non-conservative supporters do you think received those calls? Um, probably over 75%. And no, it would probably be higher than that, probably over 80%. In the case, depends which type. The, the calls on voting stations have a much clearer pattern, so I think people understood them more clearly. In that case, the, uh, the it would probably be 85, 90%, about 80% to 90%. Got the voting chain. That's correct. Station and similar numbers said that that information was incorrect. In the case of the elections, Canada it was less clear. It was about a 50% greater propensity to get it if you were not a conservative.